Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us here today at our inaugural use of the Empire Tent here in the inaugural Festival Garden. My name is Mary Jo Capps, and I'm the, so fortunate to be the chair of the Australian Festival of Chamber Music, taking over from the wonderful Sandra Yates, who's here with us in the audience today. And as we commence, I'd first of all like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered, and to pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. We have many wonderful people in the audience today, and this is going to be a novelty for all of us. This is A, the first, last time anyone will be standing um, for, for conversation, but people are free to move forward and make comments at any point during the conversation. This is very much encouraged to be an interactive discussion. We have four people on Zoom today, and 10 around the table here all of whom have varying experiences of regional arts. What arts in the regions do to stimulate the economy, what they do to develop talent, what they deliver to social cohesion, the many benefits that we know things such as this festival deliver to the re regional Australia. So my role will be to ask a few prompt questions and to introduce each person as I go around with those prompt questions but after that, who knows? <laughs> this is our first time doing the Festival Garden with a new artistic director, Jack Liebeck. Very good. And a new bundle of energy as our new executive director, Ricardo Peach. A production team who are largely doing their jobs for the first time, and we've got almost twice as many events in a festival that we haven't held for three years. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, um, I had looked at this wonderful lineup that Ricardo has pulled together for our first industry roundtable, and really felt that the grouping of everybody here fell into various categories. We have several people who have experience, lived experience, of what it's like making music, making art in regional Australia. What lessons, what insights do they have to offer? We have those who are very much connected then with touring from a metropolitan centre to regional Australia. And what do we see changing on that front? What are the challenges and opportunities? As well as with connectivity, both across the country and internationally. Education plays a big role in that. And what and how do we manage those elements? And then finally, what can be done to stimulate and to address some of those challenges at a philanthropy level, at a local, state, and federal government level? So, that's a lot to get through in our time together, so I'm going to start with Lindy Hume, who I believe... Ah, well that's number one for regional arts. <laughs> Connectivity. <laughs> we have a living example here. Um, we also have apologies from Jonathan Pavetto from the Australian Economic, Australian Economic Consultants. And we have a delayed arrival of Jennifer from Arts Queensland. And we have, oh, from JCU, from Ryan Daniel, who's also not able to join us today um, from the original list. Well, then we'll skip right over Lindy until she has some connectivity. And I might go to Matt Higgins from Dance North, um, based here in Townsville, perhaps to, to share some insights from what it's like as a regional arts company and uh, some of those challenges and opportunities of making art place-based in regional Australia. Wonderful, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we are Dance North and we're a contemporary dance company based here in Townsville um, with a strong presence here in Townsville and a commitment to touring um, work across the globe. Obviously with the COVID pandemic that has um, been more refined to uh, domestic touring. I think um, for us as a company, we really relish and embrace uh, the life here in regional Australia. 
Um, I think uh, it's thoroughly in conducive to creativity. Um, there's a lot of space um, physically and mentally to be able to create new work. Um, but there are also obviously some challenges in connection, connection with peers um, that we need to overcome. And connection more broadly to the, to the industry and to philanthropists, media, and all of those other stakeholders that support a flourishing arts ecology. Is that a brief? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long I'm meant to talk for. <laughs> <laughs> Just to see. Krista, certainly um, from your experience as a performing arts company who move into in and mm. out of regional Australia, what have you seen change over time? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I'm from Topology. We're uh, performing uh, arts ensemble music based originally, but in our education programs, in our creative academy, we've moved. We've always collaborated a lot um, in Topology. So I guess in that way, um, we're still collaborating. I think, um, is that you talking pre-COVID? What have I seen changed? Um, Post-COVID, there's been a lot. Um, we have our performing ensemble tours all over the world, not, you know, give or take a few COVID years. Um, we have a creative academy that is skills-based. Um, we cover everything from uh, skills from prep to tertiary to uh, people who already have skills and also we cover a lot of people coming in who don't have any skills, so experiences, creative processes, um, and we have a cre uh, growing creative communities uh, program as well. We have a big presence um, pretty much on continuous rotation around Queensland, regional Queensland, and we are about um, building social capacity because I am very passionate about having people involved in the creative process and what that does for a community, what that does for a person, what that does for their capacity to um, live a healthy life, basically. Um, you don't have to have any prior experience in some of our programs. But, you know, I was talking to Mary before. For us, it's about a long, slow burn. So we are from Brisbane and we, we always feel like we're the city people um, because there's nothing like living full time in regional Queensland. Um, but we're there a lot and we get to know communities over a very long period of time. We are now employing people in communities as project officers and, and um, for us, if we, we imagine a trajectory over a long period and in the middle of that trajectory um, is employing somebody and then it goes further, so it's a really slow, I'm talking, you know, five, eight years. Um, and we have seen that, so we've been doing um, this probably 15, 20 years. Um, developed more recently in the more, you know, recent eight years we've been developing a new strategy of how we get to know people. Um, how have I seen it change? Yeah, that's a really hard question because we're, we're getting to know things ourselves, so, um, yeah. Certainly what you mentioned about that long, slow burn, and I would imagine many of you who either live in regional Australia or have experience in working, in the arts in regional Australia would say that that has been a shift about moving from the fly-in, fly-out model to, the, um, to that skills development over time and um, really embedding the art making as a, 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 a central part of the local activity. Well, that is definitely something that we're, we're hearing from communities because, uh, you know, about 15 years ago, it was very common, the, the FIFO, you know, you go do your workshop, you do your concert, and there you've, you've had your... Um, we definitely, the feedback we're getting is that's not what regional communities want at all. So we don't even consider it really in what we do, which is probably why it goes now, goes over my head, but that is definitely the feedback we're getting when we get to know people, yeah. And Kate O'Hara from Umbrella Contemporary Art Studio, um, you've certainly had a very wide experience, not only here in Townsville, but previously previously, inexperienced with speakers, um, uh, at Manangrida, um, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit. Thank you. Um, yeah, so at the moment I'm the director of Umbrella Studio Contemporary Arts, so we're a 36-year-old organisation started by artists, working for artists. 
um, growing the market for them and we do that through partnerships like we have with um, Ricardo and AFCM, so working on the installation. Um, my background has been in uh, Cambodia and in Arnhem Land, which has been developing artist practice and connecting it to growing markets. So, And seeing that actually change lives and change um, people's well-being in that it brings money in that enables more than, um, uh, I guess, there's the economic outcomes. People can pay their bills, they can feed their kids, um, they can pay for their truck to be fixed, say in Arnhem Land, and then they can go out to country and they can look after country. So it's um, it's powerful in my experience. Yeah. We can do wobbly. <laughs> Lindy, do we, is someone bringing Lindy up on the screen? We have Nigel, I think, on the screen at the moment. Hello, Nigel. Hi. Aha, Lindy Hume. Hello. Hello. <laughs> We're so pleased to see you. You are our living example of one of the challenges of regional arts so, <laughs> and connectivity. And um, I don't know whether you heard Kate O'Hara just talking about the power that comes from enabling arts, place-based arts, and for that um, stimulation and connecting in the artistic process. In the visual arts, uh, you have a wide experience across a number of performing arts, particularly 10 Days in the Island, you know, the, any number of, of festivals, international and national and um, opera direction around the world. But for today's purposes, Lindy, could you share a little bit with uh, about the 10 Days on the Island experience and being based in Burnie, what, what has that meant to the festival and to the people of Burnie? Um, yeah, I think it's been a really interesting thing to move, move 10 Days on the Island from Hobart, where obviously there's a lot more cultural infrastructure and a lot more, you know, critical mass of organisations, arts organisations and, and audiences, to a place like Burnie, which is about 20,000 people in a very, in an industrial town, industrial coastal town, which has quite a lot of disadvantage. Um, social disadvantage that when uh, it, it had the, the pulp uh, factory as the center of its you know universe up until about 12 years ago and now it's trying to reinvent itself and it's it's really uh, an interesting thing to see how much the um, moving the festival from from Hobart to the Northwest and to Burnie has led to these community and cultural and, and indeed economic benefits for Bernie. I, I guess that I can see, I can really visibly see over my time, over three festivals, 2019, 2021 and 2023 in planning, that's that's really come to, um, to be very clear. We have in, in fact created quite a lot of new cultural infrastructure in partnership with our community. Uh, there's a new, there are two new um, galleries art galleries in Burnie, partly because of 10 Days on the Island needing other spaces to present our, um, our, our festival offering. So we have a new, we put a pop-up gallery in the old pulp building to play, to present Lisa Rehanna's very beautiful video, epic video work. And so we've created a new sort of industrial space type gallery and the same thing in the CBD, we've created an, a pop-up gallery for um, a white box kind of gallery out of the Dick Smith um, shop. So the, the, we now have two new galleries in Burnie. We have um, put a lot of uh, local people into full-time, quite high-level arts um, employment, in, and um, we've trained up over those t that time. You know, new marketing uh, director and head of brand sponsorship and development coordinators, um, technical director, um, and, uh, you know, quite high level production people into our festival. So there's a, you know, really the arts infrastructure that, that Bernie now has and didn't have before is all because of 10 days on the island. But of course, our real job, <laughs> I mean, our, obviously we have an economic job to do, but our real job is inspiring the social imagination of our community with events that bring people together and big kind of um, connections between 
um, all, all the different parts of the of the community, the, the farmers and the First Nations people and the um, uh, the kind of uh, the business people and uh, tourists, tourism and and the the university, everyone comes together in a small community, as you all know, and that um, has economic benefits too. The, the the sense of event and gathering and um, even place things like coffee shops and restaurants and and um, you know social hubs um, are the are the, the lifeblood of our festival. Um, and just to use another example before before I go, I also think about my my great um, my example of the Tathra Hotel in in Tathra where I have where I live too. Um, when it removed the poker machines and the and the TAB, which are supposed to be the kind of economic you know driver of of so many pubs, it became a much more thriving place of pride for the community. And it and the lineup that the Tathra Hotel has of local musicians and artists and the Headland Writers Festival and its plans to build a theatre at the back of the Tathra Hotel, those things are making that that hotel much more economically viable than the old TAB and poker machines of the past. So they're two examples that are close to my heart, Mary Jane. And really excellent ones. And um, I'm going to break with my mental um, architecture here because what you've just mentioned is so important, the idea that it's not just what the arts activity itself stimulates while it's there, but that flow on, the additional arts activity and the additional infrastructure, which makes me want to go to David Francis um, and your experience at Four Winds. Um, again, these are small communities. I mean, Bermagui is 2,000 people. We're not talking a large place. And yet, what Four Winds did, that. Lindy was also associated with, and with the bringing community together, but also with the construction of the Windsong Pavilion. What a difference that's made. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be part of the discussion. Um, so I not only was the uh, executive uh, director of Four Winds for five years, um, before I came to Australia, I was the director of a rural arts centre in the southwest of England. So um, what I've really observed from my point of view is that there are four key things, four key measurables that need to be in place really to allow the arts to thrive in remote and rural communities. And um, infrastructure is part of this, so I'm going to get to that. But the first thing I would say is that there absolutely has to be an authentic, creative life force. There has to be a beating heart, um, and there, therefore there has to be a reason for that arts infrastructure to be there. And there also has to be a community of people around that that really want to sustain that life force, that want to sustain that beating heart and recognize it as important. Because without that, it's not sustainable into the future. So that, that, that's the first thing, is the creative life force. The second thing, which comes to infrastructure, is really around creative capital. So what I see is that the infrastructure associated with the arts can really lend creative capital to towns and regions. So when I was at Four Winds, people would bring their visitors to look at our beautiful amphitheatre and our beautiful hall, even though, and it, it was a sense of pride that was there in their region. And they couldn't believe the quality and the world-class nature of what had been built nine kilometres into the bush on the far south coast of New South Wales. So there's something around um, infrastructure that really generates creative capital in people's minds and validates them and why they live there and why they want to spend time there. Um, but also in terms of creative capital, and Lindy knows this as well, it's also about, um, it can be about creative communities that come together. So it's about um, a group of like-minded people and arts, artists coming together and coalescing in one place. And that's not necessarily around um, infrastructure, but it's about a community who have the same values, the same artistic ideals, and are, in a sense, creating a collective around a creative energy. 
And that then can attract other people who, who, want, who might think that they can add value to that creative energy that's existing through other creative enterprise and entrepreneurship and so on. So actually that creative capital can exist within a community of people as much as in the presence of um, infrastructure. So the, the third one um, that I wanted to talk about really was social impact, which you touched on uh, in your introduction there. But actually, communities have to be and want to be really proud of the arts that is existing in their community. The, the arts infrastructure, the arts organisations need the community to be real advocates for what is going on and real champions for having that activity in their area. They, the, the community has to understand and value the arts. So the things like the social cohesion that comes with taking part in arts activity or new opportunities for education, for participation, social cohesion, you know, the list goes on. But actually these are all things that arts organisations in rural communities particularly really need to engage their communities in understanding uh, the importance in order to really talk about social impact. And then for me the last one of course is uh, economic impact and our kind of pre-panel reading really focused on economic impact. So I think what I'm saying, what I, I would propose is that economic impact is not the only argument. If you want to talk in economic terms, I would say there is a kind of quadruple bottom line for the arts, which comprise of these four things of which economic impact is only one. But the economic impact, of course, is about the income that arts organisations bring to their communities, um, the investment that they bring into the local economy through visitation and discretionary spend and so on. In providing employment at Wollongong Conservatorium, I employ 72 musicians. So there are 72 musicians who can live and work in Wollongong because the, of the presence of the conservatorium there. There's the volunteer economy that emerges as a result. Four Winds had 300 registered volunteers, which in a town of 2,000 people, that's pretty good going. Yeah, um, and of course, uh, we were a destination as well. Bermagui is an absolutely beautiful place to visit. So there was that whole element of tourism and how the presence of the festival created an additional reason for people to visit um, Bermagui. So, so for me, um, in my experience, these four things have to be in balance. They have to exist. Um, sometimes, you know, if you've got a really exciting capital project like we had at, at Four Winds in Bermagui, the capital thing will come to the fore. But actually, it cannot just be about that one thing. It has to ultimately be about a balance of these four elements. And um, so when I think about, you know, examples of good, I would say I'd, li I'd love to think that Four Winds <laughs> is an example of good. And, you know, I loved your introduction. And my, um, my experience of going to Four Winds was that the challenge was we have a successful biennial music festival. We'd really like you to create a year-round arts organisation with infrastructure that's nine kilometres into the bush in a remote and rural part of New South Wales where there's only 2,000 people in the local town. So it's like, yeah, what can go wrong? <laughs> so, uh, so I had that same challenge. I think if you want to see examples of how not to do it, there was a big capital spend in the UK, probably in the sort of 80s and 90s, with the advent of the National Lottery and the National Centre for Popular Music in Sheffield, which is a regional city, a great case study of what not to do. <laughs> I have the feeling that Anne -Marie, Councillor Anne-Marie Greeny from the, the Townsville City Council might want to pick up on a few of your comments. So why don't I pass the mic right back down? Thank you, Mary Jo, and uh, thank you for having me here this morning. Um, for those who I don't know in the audience, I'm Councillor Anne-Marie Greeny. I'm the Chair of Community and Cultural Development at the Townsville City Council. Um, and you can't have one without the other, I think, is um, is probably the, the statement of um, that my committee um, certainly abides by. We run, we have $39 million in this year's budget and that encompasses all things arts, galleries, libraries, uh, community development, um, yeah, a whole gamut of things. The thing that I think that I've taken on board, and I've written a few things down here, and one is like legacy and one is infrastructure, and I think um, Townsville is definitely on that cusp of um, major infrastructure happening for the arts community. I think we all know that, um, and there are some things that I can talk about and some other things that I can't talk about, but yeah, Townsville is de definitely on the cusp 
of um, some wonderful things I think to about about to happen um, here and it just is a sign of when local state and federal government all are on the same page and we have the arts community all on the same page and some of the wonderful things that we can achieve so watch this space fingers crossed um, the other thing that I that I that I think goes hand in glove with it is also, um, and I think COVID has has definitely shone a light on this, is livability within our communities. And what do we need to make Townsville a great place to live? What are we going to do to attract the 25 to 40 year olds that want to come here, that want to work here? We need a thriving arts and cultural community. So they're the kind of things that um, I've picked up on. I'm happy to talk further, but I think that's enough for the moment. <laughs> We'll be coming back to you, Anne-Marie. <laughs> <I hope so. laughs> but that is so true, what you talk about, you and David, you think of a place like Banff of less than 9,000 people, and yet it is known internationally for its arts and culture. And it's really exciting to see that Townsville, Mayor Jenny Hill absolutely saying Townsville is going to be the cultural capital of North Queensland. So watch this space, everyone. <laughs> and we're, we're certainly, uh, that beating heart is very much central to all of that. So thanks to both of you. I do want to go back to this idea of that give and take, that exchange of energies and talent development. And Kevin Dupreeze, I know with Monkey Bar Theatre, you have seen, witnessed a great deal of that. And you might also want to talk about arts leadership development with your previous hat at the Australia Council. Thanks, Mary Jo, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin, and I'm from Sydney. Um, and I work for an organisation called Monkey Bar Theatre Company. So you most probably would have seen if you have some young people in your lives, um, Edward the Emu and um, maybe Pete the Sheep and um, Die of a Wombat, these, these are the wonderful work works that um, we create firstly with young people that provide the input and, and the creativity to create professional theatre that, that then we tour all around Australia. Um, Monkey Bar has been around for 25 years and exists because of regional Australia. Um, we are based in Sydney um, and after all of these years, COVID has um, sped up our, our shifting away from a um, metropolitan centric organisation. Um, so the idea of creating very large tours that we take literally everywhere Monkey Bar tours to over 60 communities all over Australia and close to um, 90,000 young people will see Edward the Emu, um, and, um, which is really wonderful. But during COVID, that stopped us, uh, the borders sort of um, closed and we had to really rethink about how we did that. Um, and for us, what we are doing is, is that we have shifted to thinking about place in a very different way. Um, because places where places got identity, places got stories, places got culture and and character, um, and it's those the, the the places which we've built all of these wonderful relationships with um, all around Australia, and and we feel so privileged that we have so many friends all over Australia, and we decided that it's really working with those relationships to uncover the stories that we need to tell. So the stories that we are telling now is not the stories that, that's sort of coming from our place, it's actually coming from the places to where we tour to. Um, so we are currently working with, so a couple of small examples of this is, um, well, I, I'll start with a bit of a, a, um, a worrying statistic that young people have reported, 75% of young people have reported an increase in um, mental unwellness because of COVID. Um, and, um, and we know that those, those statistics are even higher in different contexts, for instance, in regional Australia. Um, so a, a particular play that we have is called Goodbye Jamie Boyd, which deals with mental health, um, and it is specifically for um, a slightly more older um, um, audience. Um, and instead of creating that work in Sydney, the work is being created in three different communities where those young people are responding to the work um, and influencing the work that will look very differently because it speaks from that place. Um, but then we as a professional theatre company with the resources that we have 
um, will produce that work and um, have it on main stages in, you know, at the Opera House in Sydney, um, coming directly from, from that place. And for us, we are very excited about that co-creation and being in, in place to tell the stories um, with, with the community because that's, cre that's creating richer work and the stories that are being told are, are just so much more richer for, for that. To, to Mary Jo's question around skills, um, what we are experiencing at the moment, um, uh, and I know that that is also a particular issue in regional Australia, is, is that um, because of COVID, many, many practitioners or many, many art workers have left the industry. Um, uh, what is keeping me up at night is finding a lighting technician who is willing to come and work for us. Uh, and, and that's, that's a worry um, because m many, many practitioners and artists have left to go and find work elsewhere um, that will pay the bills. So uh, we've got a very big challenge on our hands to, to build and to create new skills and to um, uh, ha have more workers come back to, back to the industry. Um, so if you know any lighting in, um, technicians, <laughs> if you've got a young person wanting to a job in Sydney, please send them my way. Um, so um, if just a few key, th key, key things is, is that I think this, the, the relationship between how an organisation that's in the city um, um, is shifting. For us, it's about relationships, it's about place, it's about storytelling, um, and it's, it's about where the work is being created. That, um, that's really exciting for us. Um, and and, and I would, I'm very keen to also talk about employment and, and, and all of those sort of things as the conversation goes. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thank you, Kevin. And that, that really nicely starts to raise, there's so many wonderful good news stories that we've heard, but the challenges are absolutely clear for making art of any sort, of performing arts, visual arts, written, in regional Australia, that connectivity is a real issue. Um, and I thought we might turn at this point to Chris Howlett, co-director of the Australian Digital Concert Hall, who will be live streaming tonight's performance. So if you have friends who haven't yet or can't make it to Townsville, get on to ADCH straight away. His co-director, Adele Schonhart, is in the audience with us. And I think that this miracle startup of the uh, pandemic taught us a lot about connectivity and the arts in regional Australia. Over to you, Chris. Well, thank you, MJ. Um, absolutely. So Australian Digital Concert Hall was a quick response to an industry that shut down. Adele and I first spoke 2020, March 17. On the 27th of March, just 10 days later, we did our first broadcast. It was to support the artists and the technicians because they had lost work. We honestly believed it would probably go for a couple of weeks and two and a half years later, we've now raised for the artists, which I should say enabled. They've earned $2 million through our platform and we've enabled the technicians to, and reinvested uh, another million dollars into the industry to support the technicians, the piano tuners, the stage managers. <laughs> all those people that aren't on the glossy front cover of the magazines. We started for the artists, but very quickly we realised that there was another really important part of the ecosystem that is the arts, and that is the audience. That is the people that attend and those who help define the arts by attending and giving so much energy and being so supportive of the artists. As, as cellist myself, it's really great to play, but unless I'm playing to someone, then we're kind of missing 50% of everything. It really came into focus for Adele and I when we had a call very early on is in the pandemic, um, people that come to festivals that we know and come to our physical events, they live a couple of hours out of Hamilton. They have a cattle farm and she fell on a motorbike and crushed her hip. It was something that they had to drive with the, you know, straight down to the Royal Melbourne, so because she needed instantly to get a hip replacement. He wasn't allowed to come in because it was ma maximum COVID. It just wasn't possible to have anyone in the hospital. So he said, right, well, you know, wave goodbye at the emergency door, and that was it. 
However, we, Adele and I still look after the 1300 help number and we were able to give them a shared experience. That by we set up their, her iPad and his iPad 400 kilometres away from each other and they sat up, he sat in the farm, she sat up in the emergency ward um, after her hip replacement and watched the same concert. In the interval, they had the same conversations as they would if they were here, for example. He was probably having the wine and the magnum. She probably wasn't allowed. <laughs> but that was a real catalyst for us to realise that through the power of digital, you could break down those geographical boundaries, which are so important. We continue to support musicians, and we always will, but going forward, this enabling element is very much key. So we've done quite a lot of extensive surveys. 34% of our 25,000 people community is regional. 60% of them watch predominantly concerts that aren't in their city. And 64% of our demographic say that they feel like they're over 65 and don't like driving. They have a disability, they're a carer, they're a new parent, or they feel like they're socioeconomically restricted. Now, those people are the people that we all talk about, but we, we, you know, it's always hard to reach, and through digital, we are able to reach them. A lot of our broadcasts over the last two years have been metro out to regional, you know, because that's where a lot of the art is happening. However, it was not enough for us because Adele and I have spent a lot of time with wearing our other hats or our past hats, Bendigo Chamber Music Festival, Adele working with MJ in, from Music Aviva, realising that regional is so important to broadcast from regional into metro, not just giving it the other way. So through Adele's amazing grant writing ability, we've just got Playing Australia. So that is all about showcasing regional venues and broadcasting them in to the metropolitan area, working with the regional techs, upskilling them when they're available, because that is a huge problem, going and taking our Oz Council cameras and giving them three steps. The first time we sit there with them and we show them absolutely everything as if they know nothing. And that's how they like it. The second time, their techs lead. And then the third time, we sit back and we only work remotely. And the proudness of the technicians, the proudness of the venues who thought digital was just too hard, but they're showcasing their venue to, the, you know, to Australia. And also increasingly, we've got 9% now that's international to the world. There was a call the other day of some, a regional venue saying, we got feedback from England. You know, that proudness is incredible. You know, the other way that we continue to work and increasingly work with the regional, we were in Perth working with Circuit West this week about doing private broadcasts. It might be Perth Symphony, or it might be Wazo, and they work perhaps with you know, a seven hour drive venue and they can only get there once, maybe twice a year, but the power of broadcasting just for that venue so they're doing, they might do a concert, you know, in the Perth Concert Hall, but the person comes on stage and says hello to everybody, but hello also Kagoolie, you know, who we're broadcasting exclusively for, and they're broadcasting into their venue and they've sold live tickets as if it's a normal concert. The power of that, and the empowerment that has to that venue is absolutely incredible. So for us, the power of digital is, you know, is what we're so excited about because it breaks down those socioeconomic, it breaks down those geographic boundaries so we can showcase the ecology system that is Australian arts to everyone. It's such a stirring story, so hats off to both of you. And, and the, the data that showed that I think uh, was a very large percentage, was that a third of your audience were not going to concerts before COVID. <laughs> So it wasn't COVID that stopped them from going, it was all those other factors of being carers, new parents, too remote, economically restricted, all those elements which they felt that performing arts was not going to be part of their world. They were interested in it, but they were not able to actively participate and now can. And we know from personal experience, the AFCM that broadcast on, <coughs> excuse me, on ADCH two years, Two years ago? Two years ago. 
And looking particularly, um, we had a wonderful broadcast with uh, Lloyd Van Hoff, who then joined us for drinks afterwards. And we actually had a little Zoom session with everybody who was um, watching this together, where we had a wine tasting and talked about the concert together. So it is a, a, a wonderful extension of what can happen in, um, with those regional broadcasts brought together digitally. But it is also the issue of con connecting regional artists out beyond their own community and about beyond their own geographic bounds. And I'm going to move over to Pippa from AsiaLink to talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Thank you, and so many great stories. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, yeah, I work at AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne, and our mission is to drive Australia's creative engagement with the Indo-Pacific. Um, we're particularly interested in regional Australia, firstly because of the enormous creativity that happens outside the centres, and secondly because the connectivity between um, Australia and the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific has biased the centres and somewhat ignored the regional Australia for a long time. However, um, having said that, there are a lot of regional areas, as you would know, here in Townsville that have very strong connections to, through geographic position and family connection to the, the broader international region. So we're dealing with a very diverse set of circumstances across Australia and trying to analyse what the barriers to engagement in different areas might be and create programs um, to deliver greater connectivity. And one of those programs is a new one we're about to launch called Regional Regional, which is bringing together festival producers and directors from across Australia um, and the Indo-Pacific at this point, Japan, India, Indonesia, Vanuatu, and also um, New Zealand. Um, did I say Indonesia? I got up very early. <laughs> I'm not sure I can remember anything at the moment. Um, so it's a really exciting opportunity and it picks up on some of the things that have been mentioned today around um, how we engage, what does cross-cultural engagement look like and what does cross-cultural engagement even in Australia um, look like and what can we learn from First Nations um, communities as well. Um, when we're thinking about international engagement, people, I think, automatically think of new markets, so um, a sort of economic viability for Australian artists and organisations. Um, we try and think beyond that and try and couch a conversation around cultural capability as well. So going back to what Lindy said, I think was really interesting. I'm also from Tasmania and I, I owned a pub and I got rid of the pokey machines and I put music um, in two or three times a week. And rather than I had business partners, so it wasn't necessarily an easy sell, the pokies getting rid of them was, but investing in the music wasn't necessarily. Um, and I think if you approach any problem from a, um, a non-dollar value proposition to start with, don't go in with the economic conversation first. I really just don't think it's useful. We've been making economic um, arguments in Australia for a very long time, all the Deloitte access economic reports about the value of investment of the arts and its contribution to the economy in Australia, I don't think has made a huge difference. I think what makes a difference is the people and the possibilities that come from the connection and all the social cohesion um, and the livability um, that we've been talking about, but of course people need to make a living. But if you get all of those circumstances right and the environment, then the money will flow because people are coming, people are happy, people are investing. So with our international relations, we take that sort of non-extractive position as well, looking at co-production, collaboration, cultural competency and artistic competency as well from that and then obviously the market opportunities arise from collaboration, co-production, et cetera. So that's where we are at the moment. And I think you know, up here in Townsville, we are so uniquely positioned to really leverage from engagement with the Pacific and with Asia more broadly, um, just by nature of where you are. You're so lucky um, to have that down south. It's a little bit more challenging, to be honest, although the diaspora communities are very, very large and there are huge opportunities from that. So what can all of this drive? And we think of our work in pipelines um, only because it's easier, but it's really not that linear, to be honest. Um, but creating a conversation is first. Making connections, sharing insights, building capabilities, and then really investing in the collaboration and the co-production outcomes. 
Who's the beneficiary of all of that? You are, audiences. Diversifying audiences and creating opportunity for new audience engagement through diversification um, as well. So that's probably all I have to say on the matter at the moment. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Pippa, and, and a really exciting program to see that it's launched. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We might go back to our screen because, as you mentioned, and several have mentioned around the table, the importance of investing in people, in developing those skills and sharing skills. And um, I think we have both Nigel and is Anne Frankenberg also on? Ah, all right. So Anne Frankenberg is also having problems with connectivity in a f physical sense. But Nigel Lavender with the Flying Arts Alliance, and you have a very interesting title of Cultural Tourism Accelerator Officer, which is but has to be one of the best titles I've ever heard. Um, but could you share with us a little bit about this element of stimulation of arts, uh, regional arts activity? Sure, well, I'll come back to cultural tourism, if that's okay. I do have, I run a, a grant program called Cultural Tourism Accelerator for Flying Arts. But I wanted to start firstly by saying I'm calling in from Jagera Country near Ipswich, outside Brisbane. Um, I'm a freelance independent uh, producer and consultant with multiple clients, but I, have, I wanted to talk about two examples of work that I've been really engaged in the last two years involving regional communities and supporting regional artists. And on one level, it's about the grassroots engagement that's so important to support regional artists and, uh, and communities. On the other, it's the higher level of how um, grant schemes can really make a difference. So um, one of my most amazing projects that I've ever been involved with is taking the big anxiety, which is the University of New South Wales uh, initiative out to regional Queensland, which we did this year, as well as Brisbane, um, taking um, exhibits to Warwick and uh, the Gold Coast, which really engaged with the community. And to briefly, uh, I mean, I've done all the stories about social well-being um, and engagement in communities, I, I, I absolutely endorse, not least because I ran Queensland Music Festival for a long time. Um, but this particular example, I think, is really powerful in terms of illustrating what the arts can do in communities. So we engaged with a non-arts community in Warwick, which was brought together by a crisis in mental health in the community. And over three days, we engaged with that community and the gallery for a longer period of time to create engagement uh, using the arts through um, the theater of the oppressed and through uh, particular uh, engagement through um, music and workshops to really get the community talking about mental health. And the first day went really well, really well. And on the, st the second morning, I was the first person in the room when somebody walked in beaming. And this lady had revealed the previous day she'd lost a daughter and two nephews to suicide the last three years. She walked in beaming to say that she'd gone home the previous night and for the first time in her life written a poem. And the other thing she did that night was for the first time in two years look at a photograph of her daughter. This is the impact that the arts can have in disadvantaged communities, people who are not able normally to access uh, services and that's a really big problem and the arts can provide pathways that other, uh, or other things cannot do. So at a grassroots level, the big anxiety went in and made a really, really big difference, even though it was taking uh, an initiative from Sydney to a little outback uh, regional town uh, by Warwick. Nonetheless, it, made a, uh, it was a really important intervention in that space. Um, the other thing I've been really involved with the last two years is running a regional arts fund, uh, which as most of you know, is a national initiative through Regional Arts Australia um, and uh, it has had a lot of well some extra money in recent times to deliver support for regional artists but that's the, the small grants that are delivered and there's no more than thirty thousand dollars available make a massive difference to people living and working in regional and remote Australia struggling to make arts activity happen the cultural tourism initiative and cultural tourism of course is well known to all of you not least because you were visiting the AFCM, um, is of course crucial in terms of building visitation and economic benefit and community engagement in small regional communities. And that's what the Cultural Tourism Accelerator 
rental fund is designed to talk about it at length, but the figures speak for themselves. It was a $600,000 program, which by most standards is a significant intervention in one state, $5 million nationally, to enable regional artists to increase visitation to their events. And in a post-COVID period, that has been incredibly important. Um, so cultural tourism, I think, is a really important way in which um, regional artists can gain uh, impact or build impact and gain visitation for their events. And it's all about investing in those regional artists. Um, that's a crucially important thing. Like I say, small grants go a long way. Um, the final thing I'd say is that we are in a period of change and challenge in terms of the economy. Um, but we are also um, at a moment when the new government is looking at its new cultural strategy. I attended a meeting with um, Tony Burke last week. He is extraordinarily dedicated to making something new happen in the arts. And although we've all heard these words before, it's very important that regional artists, organisations with a regional emphasis, make an input into the national cultural strategy consultation that's going on now. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel. You, obviously, sleep is optional on your schedule. Um, <laughs> but it, it is um, a, a good example also that when we talk about what is needed, it's easy to say, you know, to throw money at the problem. And what you're suggesting is that this is not always great dollops of money. It's about stimulating those beating hearts, about enabling some of the skills that are there to, to flourish, to make those connections. But that probably, um, and had Anne been here, we would have talked further about the role also in education. And I was hoping that she might talk about Music of Even schools focus on training teachers in regional Australia to encourage the arts. Lloyd, would you like to come up and chat with us about what you've just been doing actually with the winter school outreach? Yay! Good one, Ricardo, and breaking down the barriers here. Hi, my name is Lloyd Van Hoff, and I'm the director of the Australian Festival of Chamber Music's uh, Winter School program. I'm also an alumni of the Music of Viva in Schools program, so I spent several years touring uh, in my ensemble, Arcadia Winds, uh, throughout regional uh, communities uh, uh, in Australia. I was also one of Music of Viva Australia's uh, Future Makers um, participants. I was one of the very first, and that was a uh, professional development program that they ran, um, which has had a really, really profound effect on my job here um, at the Australian Festival of Chamber Music. So, the Winter School program, it, it, it's in two sort of uh, forms. There's a, the Winter School Outreach Program and the Advanced Winter School Program. Now, the Winter School Outreach Program is something that we started last year. It was really the only thing, one of the only things that happened at the festival, and one of the things that I'm really, really proud of, we took on um, a string duo from, from Melbourne who were alumni of the uh, winter school program from previous years, and we brought them up here for what was essentially a, a professional development program. And so what they had, um, these, these two were at a really, really interesting juncture in, in their careers. Uh, for um, young musicians, you know, graduating from university and going out into the real world, it's incredibly precarious time in, in their lives. Like finding your feet in the world of classical music is something that, that is not easy. So what we did at the Australian Festival of Chamber Music here is we gave them this incredible vehicle to get those runs on the board, to get the experience in educational settings, but also uh, concertizing as well, and concertizing in, in regional areas. Um, I'm from Charters Towers, which is about 130-ish kilometers uh, west of here, and I, I grew up there. That's where I started learning uh, music. And I'll never forget the touring ensembles that came to visit my school, and really what a profound effect that had on me as a young musician. It was one of those moments where it, it really, really clicked. And I knew, like, seeing that particular, it was a brass ensemble of all combinations of instruments, but I remember seeing them and seeing the fun that they were having making music with one another and seeing them out here in Charters Towers. Like, what on earth were they doing out here? Like, 
but I love that. Like you get to travel and you get to inspire other people. And that was, that was really one of the moments in my life where I said, I want to be a musician. And so all of those things that I've talked about, um, these, are, these are my experiences that I've tried to create in the Winter School Outreach Program. Because from also my experience with Music of Eva in schools, touring lots of places, I am never surprised by the talent that you find in just the most back, crazy backwater towns. Always talent. And I was that kid. So I, you, you never know, uh, going out into these regional communities, who you're going to inspire and where they're going to be. So at least for me and my story, this was an incredible um, case of social mobility. If I would have stayed in Charters Towers, um, I probably would have gone into mining or, I don't know, become a farmer or something like that. But uh, my life has become um, just so much more richer. Uh, I've traveled the world, I've performed all over, uh, I've worked in educational settings and regional touring, and I'm having the best time <laughs> in my career. And so that's exactly what we wanted to do with um, these young musicians uh, in the Winter School Outreach Program. Give them the opportunity to learn, but also give them the sort of uh, opportunity to inspire, you know, the other young musicians that are everywhere uh, in this country, but particularly in, in this region. So I guess that's been my role, <laughs> I think, I think, I, yeah. Having a heap of fun is a very good thing. We've been very serious about all the good things that we're doing. And it's good to remember that there's also a heap of fun to be had. And for lots of kids, as we certainly discovered in, uh, in many education programs, and I'm sure that would be the case around everybody's experience on the, um, here in the Empire Tent today, is that it is often a pathway in for kids who might otherwise be quite shut out in their education. And in fact, they find that it's because they speak through dance or they speak through acting or through music or through visual arts that their medium is not necessarily the medium that is privileged in the education system. And the arts provide another pathway in. Well, amongst those many obstacles that we have, we have some, some folks who are thinking about how the solutions might be found. Um, I'm going to turn first to the world of philanthropy because that has been, probably in my 40 years in the business, the biggest change in this country is the role that foundations and individual philanthropists have stood up and said, I'm from regional X and I want more of this in my town, or I want to see the stimulation that uh, was possible to be created through now my personal success or the foundation I'm working with. And one of the most profoundly impactful foundations is the Tim Fairfax Family Foundation, so I'm going to hand the microphone to Neil Harvey, who's the CEO there. Thank you, Mary Jo. Um, <clears throat> my name is Neil and I'm the CEO of the Tim Fairfax Family Foundation. Um, and you're absolutely right. Tim and Gina and their four daughters long ago accepted the benefits and the impact that the arts can play in their community. And they would agree furiously with all of the kind of suggestions that have been made around the table. Um, and they've applied themselves, they're not inconsiderable talents, to trying to unearth how to overcome some of the challenges that we've talked about today. Connection, distance, the desire to not fly in and, and, and leave again, the inf lack of infrastructure and the labour shortages are all problems that we face. Um, <clears throat> I think that the sector has evolved, as, as you said. I think it is professionalising um, uh, at, at an increasing pace around the country. Um, and there are a lot of philanthropists for whom regional and remote areas are a primary focus. Um, and that's probably something that is particularly unique in Australia, um, that we have such enormous distances to cover and the challenges that are associated with them, that some individuals and families and trust and foundations take on that particular challenge rather than, let's say, a social ill or a, whatever the other, the other wicked problem might be. So I think that's particularly interesting. For um, Tim and Gina, um, the current strategy focuses on building a connected, resilient, future-proof community. 
Um, and they are all values that I think everyone in this room could relate to and that all the benefit of them and that, that the arts certainly play a key role in achieving each of, in further embedding those values in each of our regional communities. Um, <clears throat> I think that probably the biggest change in terms of philanthropic intervention is the time frame in which we now look and think about interventions. So thinking about extending out that time frame and trying to ta tackle problems in an intergenerational manner. Um, short termism um, really kind of interferes with your ability to achieve and overcome these structural and systemic challenges. Um, everyone's annual budget is always too small. It's always not enough butter scraped over too much toast. Although I accept $39 million is a lot of butter. <laughs> um, when you start to look beyond one year cycle and in multi years and in decades and in generations, you can start to think about what you need to put in place now so that our kids and their kids achieve and experience a different type of life. Um, Nigel is absolutely right to bring up the national cultural policy um, process at this moment and around this table, um, that is a plan that will do exactly that, that will set in place a coordinating mechanism for all three levels of government to work together so we don't have to trade off about whether funding is dedicated to centering the artist or building the new theatre. If we think in longer time frames and have a coordinated plan to which we are all working towards to realise, um, that will see the best outcome. So encouraging everyone to make a submission is absolutely the right suggestion uh, and I would second that. Well, I guess that brings us naturally to government. <laughs> you notice that's not the first place we started because very often it can be, you know, what, what else is going, what grant can we chase? Arts organisations for too many years have tried to shape their programmes to match the current... Um, priorities of government and I think this um, new path forward where governments are working with the arts and vice versa to try and shape what is needed and what is going to be impactful and that's happening at the local at the state and at the federal um, level we might start with the local level and back to you Anne-Marie so just in terms of how's the Townsville City Council thinking about this in policy terms, what, what are the challenges, how, what are you looking for to help shape a strong cultural life in Townsville? Um, we were very fortunate um, under um, our city deals and there has been um, a lot of conversations previously, you know, in the last couple of years about, um, uh, you know, we talk about infrastructure and um, and economics and that sort of thing, but um, really it comes down to um, infrastructure for us in the arts community. We've had numerous conversations with um, a lot of organisations about what it is that we need for Townsville, um, a concert hall, a, a performing arts space, um, and, and how do we achieve that. Uh, councils are very fortunate in that we have a lot of land that we can work with state and federal governments to, um, you know, we've seen it with the stadium, those three levels of government came, you know, we all came together, um, our contribution was the land, the state government and then the federal government came on board with funding and we have a new piece of infrastructure for the city. So what we're trying to do for the arts is exactly the same thing. We have a lot of land um, and in 2016 under the city deals um, we were awarded funding to do some studies about where where and what the city needs and uh, a feasibility study is underway and it is should be ready by about October. So then once we have that, then uh, then the real battle begins and, um, and who is going to pay for what and what is going to be delivered. I think going on from that and, and the things that are born out of those levels of government working together is when we had the Commonwealth Games in um, 2018 here, the... Uh, NAFA, um, our Northern Australian Festival of Arts, was born out of Commonwealth Games funding. Um, we decided that we needed to be, we needed to have an arts festival uh, for everyone in the community. And from that, um, that you know, was one of our election commitments was to bring an arts, an arts festival to the city. I, I don't know if I've answered it very well, but I, I can say that there are a lot of things 
in the pipeline, a lot of discussions being had with different levels of government um, and a lot of vision being projected for the next five to ten years. And I mean, why wouldn't we? In 2032 we're on show to the world, so we need to have something that Townsall can uniquely hang its hat on. And, and we certainly have been talking about some of the, you know, in wanting to create one of the themes that's emerged today, wanting to create livable communities, wanting to crea create that cohesion through the arts, share skills and develop skills, and make it a two-way access, not just, you know, what, being able to bring arts into the regional centres, but what the regional centres are taking back out and what audiences can access both ways. So certainly that theme emerging of the long-term conversation, this is anything worth doing is worth spending that time in developing. And that's certainly the way that um, the federal government and it through its um, indirect uh, arm's length funding body, the Australia Council for the Arts, uh, Zohar, uh, we have, have brought in last but not least um, to talk about things from the federal perspective. So I'm going to pass the mic down to you. Hi everybody, you've done well to still be engaged as I do this. Sorry. Um, my name is Zohar Spatz. I, um, I do work for the Australia Council for the Arts. Um, my role there is an interesting one. It's incredibly non-bureaucratic. I am the head of community and experimental arts practice. So within the organisation, there are a number of heads of practice that focus on connecting artists to artists and um, giving strategic advice and being a pipeline and a voice at a table when often they're not at that table, which is really exciting and I'm thrilled to be at this particular long table today. Thank you. Um, people have spoken a little bit about the national plan, so I thought that might be a really great place for me to start. Um, the federal government, as it stands, um, acknowledges that over the last 10 years since Simon Crean and Julia Gillard released uh, a national cultural policy, it was actually placed on ice and we haven't necessarily moved forward with that. So there's a sense of urgency, as Nigel said. Uh, the current arts minister, Tony Burke, is going across the country and encouraging people to place submissions um, that go uh, against the actual um, Creative Australia. So the plan around that, there's five pillars um, within that and I thought I might t talk you through them because regionality in this conversation is not in isolation. As we go through them, you'll realise that there's connectivity with regions across all of those five pillars. And when we talk about submissions, they're talking about ge genuinely great recommendations for them to action forward, just like Australia Council. So the first pillar, and they are purposely in this order, um, it's by design, um, and there is a sense of urgency. Uh, Tony Burke has been clear, we do not have time to waste. So whilst this plan may be slightly imperfect, it will be a plan and it will be in place by the end of the year. And that's an incredibly exciting prospect for an industry that has felt slightly devalued and forgotten about, to be able to hear your arts minister say, I see you and I value you, was a pretty special moment and I was in the room with Nigel and there was some tears. So the first pillar, is First Nations and it's recognising the crucial place of their stories and song lines at the centre of our arts practice here in this country. So I'd like to recognise the traditional custodians on the land on which we gather um, and any Indigenous peoples here with us today. The second pillar is a place for every story. So diversity counts, regionality counts in that. Um, so do a variety of socioeconomic peoples and backgrounds, um, migrants, refugees, what does Australia look like and a place for everyone's story in that. The third is the centrality of the artist and the arts worker. So we talked a lot earlier about pathways and employment and what are we doing with the ecology when it's slightly broken and people have moved away. So how do we make sure that not just the core centrality of art and the artist, but also the arts worker, the lighting designer that Kevin, or the operator that Kevin's trying to find in Sydney. We need to bring them into the core. 
The fourth is strong institutions. And what was really interesting for me was to hear that institutions aren't just what we remember them to be. Institutions is this festival. Institutions is Dance North, who recently in 2021 became part of the National Performing Arts Framework and became a major with consistent funding. In fact, during that period of time, there were four new regional organisations that became entrance into that sustainability. That's really exciting. 68% of Australia Council's four-year funded organisations are from regional Australia. Um, it also means an institution could be the pub that plays music in Tassie three nights a week. What does that look like? We've got to think bigger and broader. And the fifth one is actually what we've sort of talked a little bit about, which is reaching our audiences. And just another statistic, 68% of Australians that live in regional Australia and 64 in remote attend arts events. We already know that. So the amazing work that you're doing regionally in growing that audience base, but they do attend. So it's on us to build up those institutions. And speaking of what I've heard around the table, success looks like partnership. Success looks like local, state, federal, sure. But it also looks like philanthropic. It looks like a strong sector and a group of these people spending time around not just a long table talking to you, but hearing from you, and then also coming up with a plan together that is place-based, that responds and reflects the community and what you need and what you're going to continue to come to. That's not bad for eight weeks in the job. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of passion, there's a lot of commitment, there's a lot of talent, and there's a lot of hope, I think, that's emerging today. Uh, we did promise some interactivity. We haven't done so well, which is me, hasn't done so well on that. In our final few minutes, are there comments people would like to share? Lynn? Apparently, Lynn Bender has just been dobbed in. Lynn is a newest board member of the Australian Festival of Chamber Music and was previously the CEO of the Helen McPherson Smith Trust, so knows a lot about, again, thinking strategically about investment in the arts, but regional in particular. Thank you, MJ, for coordinating all being the brainchild behind this. Um, it's, the key is collaboration and partnership and listening and hearing and seeing how we can work together. So this is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it was interesting listening to Four Winds and Asia Link and, and also seeing uh, Neil here, who is with the Maya Foundation. And of course, Carillo Gantner uh, and the Maya Foundation were the corn not just the cornerstones, but the drivers behind the br literally the brainchild. Yes, there was momentum afterwards, but again, the power of individuals with an extraordinary vision and with a powerful voice and who can influence and who can build partnerships with government cannot be underestimated. And just, you know, even with the digital concert hall, <laughs> you know, um, I remember well, you know, the call we had. And just to say what you're doing is extraordinary because you're empowering artists. How can we help? And, you know, Chris, you're entrepreneurial. Make it happen because we can't fund you <laughs> personally and individually. And you did. But again, that's the power of philanthropy and understanding how you can engage with, with good people who are really well connected. And... Pippi, you're absolutely correct when you had said that the, 
You start with the idea. The money will come if the need is genuine and you're addressing that need with integrity. That's your case for support. And fundamentally, that's what we need to do. And Neil, you're 100% correct when you were saying that there has been a shift in philanthropy. We are looking for long-term benefits. You know, um, in terms of the arts, I'd always laughingly said, and I don't know why I, pour, I, I pick on the poor Nutcracker, but we would never um, fund another production of the Nutcracker. Not that there shouldn't be one, but it's about the long-term benefits. How can we actually look at the long tail? Everything that we do needs to have a long tail. It needs to empower the communities, inspire, as you were saying, um, you know, build infrastructure that actually builds pride. It's, it's all of that thinking that we want to invest in. And, uh, and, and also philanthropy and the three tiers of government, we all leverage off each other. That's what we need to do. And the key is partnership and collaboration. So thank you for this inspiring conversation. Love it. Thank you for showing it's not terrifying coming up here. Or if you wish to speak from your seat, we're not going to make people move. Is there anyone else who'd like to share any reflections, any ideas, thoughts about forward motion? <laughs> Jack. Hello, everyone. Um, very inspiring to hear all of this. Um, I was kind of helicoptered in from the UK as an artistic director, but I knew the festival really well, having been here so many times um, as, a, as a player. Um, and um, one of the scary things when Mary Jo was interviewing me for the job um, <laughs> was the, the, the thing about um, how, how to grow the festival. Um, because I know that everything always has to grow. You can't shrink in life. I mean, uh, but my initial thought was, my God, how do I grow something that already has six, seven, eight hundred people coming to the chamber music concerts? That I just don't want to hemorrhage the audience um, if I take the job. Um, but then I realised that that idea of growth was not about if you're already getting seven, eight hundred people to a chamber music concert. That is pretty impressive in our because it's what's the word? It's it's sort of an elite arts. Um, that we're making. Um, the actual uh, growth thing, and the thing that struck me when I was a player here, was that you'd be in town and people would say, oh, there's a POM in town, what are you doing here? And um, you'd say, oh, I'm at the Chamber Music Festival. And they'd be like, what was that? Don't know anything about that. And I was, how is that possible? This is a, you know, it should be known. And the, and the thing, the reason this brain idea came about was because I thought, okay, if we're already getting a good audience, how are we going to bring the local community to this thing so that they experience... Okay, you're not going to shove them into Shostakovich string quartets or something like that, but if you can uh, give them a space that is part of this festival, they'll hear about it, we'll put on things that are related to chain music, they'll have t a taste of it, but also then other events and local community involvement and things like that. Um, and um, this is my idea, our idea, for how we are going to sort of really introduce people to our art, chamber music, classical music, we all know it, that it's, it's just it's sort of like the pinnacle of music making. I'm sorry, I'm biased. <laughs> um, and it's not scary. And it's so annoying for us, to, 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 for people to say, oh, this is, I don't feel comfortable with this. But actually, if you just experience it, you know that it is for everybody. Um, and so I would like, you know, with, with what Lloyd's been doing this week, that this is how I got into classical music was because they came into my school and I saw, well, I can play the violin. That looks like something I could do, you know. Um, and so they, they just need one opportunity to see it in in person, and then they can 
be hooked by it, rather than just seeing it something that's, you know, maybe they flicked on the television and saw Sydney Symphony on the radio, on the, on the stage and thought, nah, it's not for me, I'm going to go watch sport or something like that. Uh, but in live, when you see it done properly, um, and the other thing is, I found the First Nation thing really interesting as a Brit because I had no idea what this was about um, at first. Um, and of course, you know, we rely heavily on William Barton in, in classical music to provide um, the classical side of the indigenous music. Um, but we need, he is the sort of like the torch and I think generations after generations will follow him because he's going to inspire and ferment that, that the idea that you could in, integrate um, First Nation music with the classical side. Um, so the thing about our stage in the main hall is that sometimes things are not necessarily going to fit super well with Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms and what all the rest of it. But they need to have an outing and they need to experience performance and they need to, to um, have an opportunity to, for music to be uh, experienced and learn and work out what works and what doesn't work. And then I reckon in 20, 30 years, when we're doing our 60th anniversary of AFCM, I'm hoping I'm still going to be artistic director. Um, <laughs> but when we have our 60th, I think we'll probably have more pieces in the main program from the First Nation composers because they will have developed their art. Um, and... Maybe I'm wrong, but that's my, my feeling about it. Yeah, it's to it give uh, as many people an opportunity to, to see what we do and um, experiment, and these stages, I think, will provide that going forward. So there we go. Derek. Thanks, Mary Jo. Um, I just thought after what you just said, I should share a little story with you. I provide accommodation for a Pakistani student down in Sydney. Um, and he's studying and knows nothing about my lifestyle, which is a lot to do with music. As part of his visa requirement, he's currently got to do an English language test. And he's getting some professional advice as to how he should prepare for that. And he was asked to write a short essay on his most memorable experience in his life. And he chose the time against his wishes that suddenly apparently happened because he only accepted because I insisted was his first night going to an opera. He thought that it was the most memorable experience of his life. He's subsequently gone to ballet, he's gone to concerts. He's not quite at chamber music yet. <laughs> but I, I think it's a classic case of what you were saying, give somebody the exposure and the response is immediate. We had someone, yes, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Very, very briefly, um, I just wanted to point out that education is key. Um, as an artist and as an educator, Sandy from TAFE over there would, would back me up. You know, we, um, and I love the way that you know, the winter school is running, um, getting young people the opportunity, giving them the opportunity to participate in the arts in whatever form that is, I think is, is very important. Without them, I mean, they're the ones that are coming up. So, um, but it's, we have struggles with, um, <laughs> with this, our institutions and, and you know, having a venue for, um, you know, the arts department at, at TAFE. Um, we, I struggle, um, you know, the arts being valued in schools. Um, so that, that they're our challenges. So I, I don't know how we fix them, but yeah. But providing opportunities is, is key. Thank you. I was just going to echo that because I, um, I was born here in Townsville and grew up here and I was really passionate about the arts but for me I left because there was no education and training opportunities here in Townsville for me. So I moved to Brisbane and that took me away from the regions to a, a capital city and I think that is happening uh, a lot in regional centres because there isn't education and training opportunities. So I think specifically for our regional creative economy we need to ask the question how are we 
uh, retaining young people, how we're engaging young people in, in the creative um, economy and in the, within the creative industries. But it's not just people who are emerging, it's also uh, established artists and arts workers as well. I think, you know, living in a, in a regional community means that we are disconnected somewhat to uh, a larger pool of our peers, in, which is, you know, when we, if we're living in Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne, there is a strong network of people who are, are like us and we can be mentored by them. But living in, in a regional place, those opportunities and those networks are harder to find. Um, and I think if Townsville wants to be the creative capital of Northern Australia, we really need to be making sure that we are attracting and retaining skilled workers within our region. And I think, you know, the RAD of funding for professional development is a fantastic opportunity, but professional development opportunities don't centre around funding deadlines. And so I think it's a real practical challenge in um, insofar as making sure that we're growing people's skills and upskilling people, but there's some real practical challenges to being able to access those opportunities. And if we look to another regional centre like Cairns, north of us, which I think the data suggests has a stronger regional economy, a creative industries economy than Townsville does, they have a really robust plan, a really robust strategy, a really robust cultural strategy, but not only just a, a cultural and creative strategy, they also have a youth arts engagement um, strategy and a disability artist strategy as well. So there, there's this a strategic framework from which we can then implement and make change. Um, they have a rolling fund for professional development that is available all year round so that our skilled workforces can continue to develop. But um, for other uh, regional centres, I think that those opportunities are harder to access. So we really need to look at how, put your, yourself into the perspective of the artist and the arts worker in the regional centre and go, how do we actually on a practical level access the opportunities that we need to, to ensure that those skilled workforces are retained in the regions? We are, uh, oh. Yeah. So we're hearing and now um, the signal is I'm standing again. <laughs> uh, beginning and end with the, uh, the bookends of MJ standing. Um, and uh, so thank you so much. It certainly is a beautiful summary that we need to not only invest in the art making, but the education behind that, the encouragement from the youngest age. No one is going to wake up at 45 and suddenly say, I'm going to become a practicing artist. Well, they might. But um, it is much more likely if they've had that encouragement and that possibility from the age of four. And so we have a, an enormous path ahead of us, an enormous opportunity to embed policies, educators, to support those who are working in those fields, both morally, financially when it's possible, and to attend, to be part of the arts community. To all of you who are doing such amazing work, thank you for taking this time out of your busy schedules. There's obviously much more that we can talk about, and let's continue the conversation throughout the festival. Ricardo, thank you for suggesting this is a way to kick off. Jack? It's going to be a fun ride ahead. So thank you, everyone here, for participating. We look forward to it.